So here we are in Microsoft Flight Simulator to look at a new add-on for the simulator, which was literally released today. So this is hot off the press, uh, only been on sale a couple of hours. And this is the DC Designs Boeing Model 75, AKA the PT-17 Stearman, sometimes known as the Cadet in uh, in military parlance. So lots and lots of different names that it's under. I will put a link to where you can get this from in the description below. That'll be the Just Flight website. It's very inexpensive, just a little bit over 10 quid, 10 pounds sterling. And because it's from Just Flight, if you've bought other stuff from Just Flight, you will have some loyalty points on your account and you can throw them at it and uh, and get the thing for probably less than a tenner if you've got some, uh, some loyalty points. So not very expensive at all. But is it worth having? Well, let's find out. So for your £10, what you get, uh, well, just over £10, what you get is a PT-17, which you see before you, and a, it's a very nice model. You get about six or seven different paint schemes with it. I wouldn't worry about that, though. People are going to go mad for this and paint it in every paint scheme under the sun, so uh, you're not going to be short of paint schemes for it. So you get one model airplane, which is the PT-17. More about why it's a PT-17 and not a PT-13 or a PT-18 in a moment. And you also get a PDF manual. The PDF manual is really good. Very impressed with that. Uh, I think it's at 26 pages, but it doesn't take very long to read. But despite the fact that it doesn't take very long to read, it is really good on stuff other than just you know, how you install the plane and things like that. Because what it actually covers is it covers navigating and flying in an aeroplane with very basic instruments where you've got no GPS or anything like that. Um, so it goes into quite some detail about how to do dead reckoning and correcting for, for wind drift and all that kind of stuff. So it's definitely worth a read, the manual. So uh, full marks to uh, DC Design for that. I thought that was a really, really nice touch because this is a pretty basic aeroplane. Now, you can see that what I'm... I've, the paint scheme I've decided to use for the purposes of this review, which is, as I say, one of about seven that you get, is the typical Army Air Corps training scheme that the airplane would have been in in the late 1930s to sort of 1940s, i.e. training for World War II for fledgling pilots. Uh, there would have been loads of them in this paint scheme uh, because there were well over 10,000 Boeing Model 75 Stearmans built uh, and lots of them would have been in this paint scheme. So you can see that it's a very, very nice model. However, I have, since this is a review and we're supposed to be comprehensive on reviews, I have spotted a very slight glitch on it. It is not the end of the world, and I'm sure that um, DC and Just Flight will patch it, but since I want to be comprehensive on a review, I'll show you what the glitch is. Can you see that we've got two pilots in the cockpit? Now then, watch what happens. Look at the pilots very closely when I move the external view to its closest extremity. Did you see that? Did you see him drop down? Uh, I'll do it again. There you go. Did you see him move? Yeah, so clearly something is affecting the, the crew when you move the camera close. Now, that in itself isn't that big a deal. That could be them hunching down in the cockpit. However, have a look what happens when I move the view around a little bit. Oops. Notice the crew disappears. If I carry on moving the view around, eventually we'll get to a point where the crew reappear. So there you go, they appear, and then they disappear. And from the side view, they appear, and then they disappear, and what have you. So there is clearly something affecting the visual model with the proximity of the camera that is making the the crew change their position and appear and disappear. Uh, it's not the end of the world, but it is something that is occurring. Now you'll notice that there are two crew members. The The Boeing statement is when, when you fly it solo, you fly it from the rear cockpit and the student is typically in the front cockpit. So on your own, when you're flying your first solo, you'd be in the back seat. The instructor would be in the back seat. The, the student would be in the front seat. So they've got a better view. You can change this to have no pilot in the front seat if you want. How you do that is you just remove the weight from there and hit OK and then the crew member is gone. You can see that crew member's gone. If I put them back 200 or 170 or what have you, they're back in there. However, that's not the only thing that you can do with the crew. Notice an interesting thing. When we go on the interior, despite the fact that I've got a crew member in the front, you can't see them from inside. That's a little bit weird. However, I, th I think they've done that for a deliberate reason of not blocking your view when you're in the rear cockpit too much. If you want to actually fly 
from the front cockpit you can shift your position there and it is fully functional so both cockpits work on this thing um, which is good because uh, you can uh, fly it from either cockpit there is another thing that you can do with the crew which is kind of interesting there's a little button down here on your radio that's where all the sort of transponder keys are but this button here says crew select on it and if you press it in it latches in and then if you look on the external view you've got a military crew there so what the thing would have looked like when uh, when the pilots were training on the thing in World War Two, if you knock that back out like that, you're back on civilian crew with woman in the front, bloke in the back. So fair few things that you can do with a crew. Let's get rid of that person like that, and we'll go with with one person on it. So more about the cockpit in a moment but before we do that let's have a little close-up look at this thing to see the level of detail on it so i moved the drone camera to that position there so that we can see the close-up detail of it and you can see a very nicely modeled engine more on that in a moment i think they've overdone it a bit on the on the propeller textures if i saw a propeller on an airplane like that i'd be thinking about twice about, about whether i wanted to fly the thing however there is a nice touch on the propeller which is there's a dc designs logo on, on the propeller on the sticker I really like that I think that's cool so you know you have to get in real close to, to see that if you if you zoom out a little bit you know it doesn't really matter engine modeling uh the 3d model is pretty good now this is you could even zoom in you can see the uh, the continental motor corporation plate on the on the the front of the engine there this is modeled as having a continental r670 engine that is what makes it a PT-17, because the military designations for Stearmans were based on what engine they were built with. Um, so if one was built with a Continental R670, it was a PT-17. R670 has seven cylinders, and there's no fancy pipes on the engines or anything like that. It's about as bare bones as it can get. If you saw a seven-cylinder engine that had a load of sort of pipes and stanchions coming off it and what have you. That would be a Jacobs R755 engine, and that would make it a PT-18 rather than a PT-17. But the, 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 I think they only built about 150 or, or so um, PT-18. See, it's pretty rare that you'd see one of them. The other one that you'd more commonly see is one with a nine-cylinder engine that has a load of pipes and tubes attached to the attached to the cylinders and stuff like that so if you see one with a nine cylinder engine that would be a lycoming r680 engine and that would make it a pt13 so for the purposes of identification if you see a stearman with a nine cylinder engine it's a pt13 with a lycoming r680 if you see one with a seven cylinder engine it's a pt17 with a continental r670 unless it's one of the much rarer pt18s with a d8 jacobs r755 there you go um post-war a lot of stearmans were modified with um with other engines uh that were more powerful but most of them whether it was the the 680 or the 670 were about 200 horsepower post-war ones you, they tended to start putting bigger engines on the things to make them a bit sporty the other thing that you see on post-war stearmans is Notice that when I move the ailerons on this thing, uh, original Stearmans only had ailerons on the lower wings. A lot of them that you see these days at air shows have been modified so that they've got ailerons on the upper wings as well. So they're much more manoeuvrable these days. So when you see Stearmans getting chucked about at air shows and doing aerobatics and they've got wing walkers on them and things like that, and you think, wow, it's pretty manoeuvrable that, they probably wouldn't have been as manoeuvrable in World War II um, when they were the original ones with only the uh, only the ailerons on the lower wings. Obviously, what you've got is you've got elevators and rudder as well. So there you go. Everything you need to know about the um, about the stem and, and whether it's a PT thirteen, a PT seventeen, or a PT eighteen. So with all that said, let's uh, let's have a bit of a fly in the thing now. The Stearman was a very very basic aeroplane, originally designed to be a sort of like sporting. Uh, by plane for civilians when it was in its model 75 guys uh, when it first came out in 1934 but very soon Stearman company uh, bought up by Boeing which gave it a lot of selling power and connections with the military which is why it ended up being the military trainer and so a lot of them are very austere military trainers incidentally if you want to know everything there is to know about the uh, the model 75 Stearman have a look on my channel for Chocks Hander episode one there's a big history of the Stearman on it if you really want to know all that stuff um, anyway on with the review so fire extinguisher doesn't do anything in the sim pitch trim lever 
you can use it like this or you can use your keyboard shortcuts if, or if you've got a, a hardware exterior trim wheel like a Logitech one, they work as well. Mixture lever, we're going to want that fully forward because we're going to be starting the engine. Throttle, we want that cracked open slightly um, because, again, uh, we, we need a little bit of power for starting the engine. Um, there is a control lock there. What that does is when you engage it is, is it locks the ailerons to stop them blowing about in the wind. Not really do, do, doing much in the sim, but for authenticity's purpose, it does... Uh, it, it's like the, like the real thing. Fuel shutoff valve, valve, we want that on because we're going to be starting the engine. Likewise, we're going to want both, both magnetos on. Uh, we're going to want the battery switch on. We're going to want the avionics on. When you switch the avionics on, if you've got an external Logitech trim wheel and autopilot and all that kind of stuff, that's going to start lighting up as well. So it does connect to exterior hardware when you turn the avionics on. Fairly standard instruments on the panel. So I've got an altimeter there, airspeed indicator, Temperature gauge and uh, and pressure. We've got a clock there, which you, you want for your bog standard navigation. RPM gauge. The important figure on that uh, for a Boeing statement is cruise speed, 1800 RPM, uh, about 105 miles per hour. Um, more about the other speeds that are important when we get this thing in the air. Turn and slip indicator, vertical speed indicator, and um, compass. And that's your lot um, as far as instruments go. We can have nav lights and we can have strobe, strobe lights on. There is a fuel primer switch there. And then coming down here, you've got carburetor heat control there. Um, you've got parking brake, which we will operate like that. And then if, you, if you've got the insane urge to, to go on vats in with this thing, then you can have a transponder on there like that, uh, and put something in. Um, and when you've got all the power on, Notice that the ATC window does come alive. So, you know, this thing, despite the fact that most uh, World War II Stearmans probably would not have had a radio, uh, this thing is depicted sort of useful for sort of uh, for modern times. So with uh, with both magnetos on and the fuel shut off valve on and having primed the engine, the real Stearman, what you would have done with the real Stearman is you would have open this panel here you would have got out a little handle you would have plugged it in to a little socket there someone would have stood behind that bracing wire so that they didn't fall into the propeller and then what they would have done is they would have turned the crank thing and wound up an inertia starter up to really really high speed and then when the inertia starter was uh, was spinning then what you would do is you would engage the inertia starter with the prop uh, and that would start the thing um, since we don't really want to do that in the sim, uh, or rather we can't do that in the sim, um, what we've uh, what we've got this depicted as is being more like a modern stearman where it's got an electric starter on the thing. So this is depicted as a sort of modern stearman in that sense. So um, let's crank the thing up. And... Uh, off she goes. Now, obviously you can either hold this thing on the brakes or you can put the hard parking brake on if you want. But we'll go on the external view. So that we can hear the engine. And what I will do is I'll get the stick back and Give you a sound of what the engine sounds like. So the engine sounds on this are pretty good. It's got kind of like that clattering and burbling and all that kind of stuff going on. They haven't gone massively loud with the thing and what have you, but you know, I think generally speaking, it's pretty good. It doesn't really do what you get on the real thing, which is on the real thing, when you get edge on to that, that propeller on the real thing, you tend to get that sort of both saw sound of the, the, the blades approaching uh, approaching supersonic speed. They can be a bit buzzy when you hear them from the side when the, the engine's wound up, and it's not really doing that, but generally speaking, it sounds more or less like the real thing, so it's pretty good in that respect. So let's go and take this thing for a fly. So if you hear clanking, that's me putting my feet on my Satek rudder pedals. Um, and believe me, you will need rudder pedals for this thing. <laughs> Unless you've got takeoff assist on, in which case 
you'll be all right in the sim. So, we go on the external view. You can see that it's you know not a problem to turn this thing on the ground, and it's it's not the world's most manoeuvrable thing on the ground, but you know you can see there that if you you kick the rudder about, no problem. And if you if you kick on some rudder and give it a bit of brakes and a little burst of power, you can get the thing round in fairly short order. So we'll get that thing lined up for 26 right. And there we go. Now what I'm going to do is for this little little sort of demonstration takeoff, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the camera back a little bit like that so you can see the rudder pedals moving because I am definitely going to have to give this right rudder um, to take off in the thing. But I haven't got any of the sort of assists on in the sim or anything like that. And it is not a nightmare to take off as long as you are ready on the rudder. But if you if you're a flight simmer that hasn't got sort of super duper rudder pedals, or you know, maybe you're finding it a little bit difficult because you've only got like a twist twist rudder or something like that, um, then I would recommend hitting hitting your options in the sim, go into assistance and turning on takeoff assist, um, just so it doesn't frustrate you. Um, because that'll help you get the thing in the air. So anyway, let's give it a little bit of power and we'll get the stick back. And a little bit more. And then we'll get the tail up. And once the tail comes up, you'll notice that I have to give it a fair bit of rudder to keep it tra tracking straight. You can back it off a little bit once it's got a little bit of momentum. And once it's doing about 75, you can get the thing in the air. And then you can take the rudder off the thing. Um, and then away you go. Now, in common with the real thing, which I do know from having a go with it, you tend to have to sort of like give it a bit of a a boot full of rudder before you hit the ailerons to get it into the turn um that's one thing i do, do remember about the thing it's sort of like you can help it into a turn a little bit by by giving it some rudder um like that. now um as far as sort of cruising along in this thing is concerned um if i get that thing level you want it on about 1800 rpm to cruise the thing which should see your airspeed indicator just passing uh 100 there we are oh, adjacent to the airfield there like that so that's kind of your cruise speed but you'd probably want to trim the thing up a little bit uh because it's not gonna without a little bit of elevator trim it's not gonna climb on that uh and obviously you know if you start giving this thing a lot of throttle you've got to keep an eye on the temperatures on this thing now then look on the external view there we are going over the trafford center at manchester um, you can see that this thing looks pretty good in the air and it sounds good you know on the external view and you'll notice that it's got uh nice nav lights on it they're not weedy ones yeah uh, which anyone who watches my reviews will know that I absolutely hate weedy nav lights on things. Um, now I'll get a little bit of height on the thing. Because the thing that we want to do with an aeroplane like this is they're great for, great for sort of exploring and what have you because there's good visibility off the thing. Um, but you're probably going to want to do a bit of aerobatics in the thing. And so give you a little bit of a demonstration of that now um one thing i have noticed with this is that as far as aileron roll rate is concerned i think the aileron roll rate is far too sprightly for this um stearmans with training airplanes they don't have uh, a massively good roll rate the the modified ones post world war ii that have ailerons on the top wing as well as on the lower wing 
have got a better roll rate, but this is an early uh, one with only ailerons on the lower wings. And if I, if I give you a full full deflection aileron roll here, um, and I'll get a little bit of speed on maybe doing that because I don't want to I don't want to do like a, a sort of stall by rolling it too fast. But you know, if I get there, here we go. That I think you'd be doing well to get a steerman to have a roll rate like that. That's more like you know the, the kind of thing you'd expect a a pit to be doing <laughs> in terms of roll rate. Uh, however, the speed that it goes at. Uh, the, the sort of maneuvering speeds and the and the cruise speeds and stuff like that are pretty good. Um, the 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 figure that you want for doing aerobatics in a in a steerman is you want to be doing about 130 ish um, to get it, to go into a loop. Um, so let's get the nose down a little bit. And there we go, about 130. And over she goes. Uh, and then you bat the throttle off a bit as you come round. And there you go. So in terms of um, you know throwing it into a roll, um, they've overcooked it a bit in terms of manoeuvrability. But as far as sort of elevator control is on the thing, I think they've got that about right. Um... And generally speaking, I think it flies pretty nicely. And the modeling's lovely on it as well. Even considering that little visual glitch with the pilots, I think the modeling on it is really, really nice. Um, now, there it is. Um, hands off, I'll prove I'm hands off. There I am clapping. Um, now then. I'm going to do something interesting here. Where are we? Right, now that, you can see the stick's not moving yet, and that is because uh, I have just put my autopilot on, my exterior Logitech autopilot, and I put the heading to zero three seven degrees and it's turning to that yeah uh, <laughs> now the real thing obviously doesn't have an autopilot but what this does tell you is that that i i quite like that when flight sim airplanes do that now i'm going to put the autopilot off and take over myself um what that does tell you is that this thing um you can either use keyboard shortcuts in the sim or an exterior autopilot um to fly this thing for, for sort of extended periods um, and I like that in the sim because you don't have to use that if you don't want to but it gives you the added bonus of being able to put the autopilot on if you want to do some you know nice screenshots uh, of things and not worry about the thing you know not steering very well and what have you. Now, I haven't got the autopilot on at the moment, but I just wanted to demonstrate that you can put the autopilot on this thing if you really, really want to. Um, which I think is kind of a nice bonus, to be honest. And I, I know the purists are going to go, oh, no, you shouldn't be able to do that. And it's like, well, well, just don't do it then. Don't don't press your autopilot switches or, you know, don't use the keyboard shortcuts for it. And then it's uh, then it's not a problem. But yeah, uh, so I would say, apart from the kind of slightly over the top roll rate of the thing, that it's pretty good. Although there is one other thing that I have noticed about it, which perhaps isn't quite like the real thing. And we're gonna see that in a minute now. Uh, but you can see it looks good in the air. 
I'll definitely give it that. It's a very, very pretty aeroplane. Very nice model. There's Manchester Airport in the distance and Old Trafford and all that kind of stuff. So, great fun for exploring around in this thing. Anyway, let's go and find somewhere to land. So, let's have a bit of a cheat and see where we are. Alright, so pretty much heading the right way for where we set off from, which is uh, Echo Golf Charlie Bravo. Nice thing about that, that is, you know, like if you're not that sure of where you are, you can cheat in the sim. But I, I'm, I think I'm more or less on course here anyway, you know what I mean? Um, but, you know, so I don't really object to cheating a bit to find, uh, find aerodromes. Now, the other thing that I've noticed with this is that. The real aeroplane, yeah, once you come off the power on the real aeroplane, that propeller acts like a big brake and the Boeing Stearman is quite a heavy aeroplane um, and it's quite draggy with the power off. I mean, it weighs about um, maybe twice that of a Cessna 172. It's a quite a heavy aeroplane. No, uh, yeah, maybe not that. Maybe, maybe maybe a three quarters as much again as it maybe about the weight of two Cessna 152s something like that um, so it's quite a heavy airplane so what happens is and it's got quite a big propeller on it as well um, uh, and so what happens is when you come off the throttle in a stearman that that propeller acts like a big brake and you know it it will sort of slow it down on the approach um, not you know it, it can't defy the laws of physics you know you you're still essentially going downhill you know so it won't lose all of the speed but you know it the thing doesn't tend to sort of maintain a massive amount of speed with that prop throttled back and what have you and this doesn't quite do that um you have to so you have to you know like take the speed back quite a bit on this um prior to bringing it in whereas on the real thing you could probably throttle it back um and have that prop break you a little bit, yeah. Um, so not not a hundred percent realistic in that sense, but you know, not a million miles away from it. Now, of course, what you can do with this thing is you can fly a curved approach, or you can bounce the nose around so that you can see the runway, or you can cheat. <laughs> and go on the external view. Well, I've got that thing throttled back, you know, and it's not really losing speed like the real thing would. So what you can end up doing is floating for a long time with it and landing a little bit long. So it could potentially catch you out that. Well, there you go. Not the hardest thing in the world to land. And as you can hear, it's got that kind of like spluttery, clattering, tap it noise of an old radial engine quite nicely. Um, I mean, if, if you turn the uh, turn the volume of the up of that in your sim, you, you're pretty much going to be there, <laughs> which is kind of cool. So, um, yeah, about the only thing that I would say about it that is not really like the real thing is it's got way too snappy a roll rate um, for an original Stearman with only uh, only the ailerons on the lower wing um, they're just not that manoeuvrable um, <laughs> be great if they were <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, because you could see how fast that thing rolled um, on the sim. So would anyone really have bothered going to the trouble of modifying them with ailerons on the upper, <laughs> upper wing if they had that kind of roll rate, you know? Um, which is, you know, sort of a doubtful proposition. So, you know, you can tell from that that, you know, it's a bit over the top. Um, so I think they should tweak that a little bit, you know, maybe back the uh, the, the aileron uh, roll rate off a little bit. Then again, you could have a go at that yourself because when this thing installs into the community folder and you can see the air file for it, so I guess you could tweak it yourself if you wanted to, which is another nice thing about this. You know, it's one of those add-ons that's not hiding the air file from you. Um, which is good. So let's bring this back to, you know, I noticed the way they put a fire engine there, you know, are they, are they trying to tell me something? <laughs> so we got that. One thing I do like about it is it doesn't, it doesn't do that. Oh, if you dare to touch the brakes, it's, it's going to go over on its nose, even if you're subtle with them. I think it's really, really nice. And I like the, uh, I like the sort of idling noises of the engine, things like that. So yeah, I think if they if they reduced the aileron roll rate on this thing a little bit, um, and maybe made it a little bit more draggy when the power is off, um, it would be pretty much on the money for the real thing. Um, and I can live with the um, I can live with the sort of like it not being quite as draggy as the real thing would would be, but I'd like to see them um, reduce the aileron roll rate on it um, a little bit so that it's more like um, more like the real thing because this was a training aeroplane. It's not a Fokker DR1. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, yeah, uh, I think it's really good. And for 10 quid, I don't think you can go wrong. Uh so yeah, here comes the, the ultimate you know, sort of review question. Do you uh, recommend it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's great fun. Um, uh, the Stearman, total classic. Anyone who doesn't like the Stearman's got something wrong with them. And this is this has far more things that are like the real thing uh, than things that aren't. And with a bit of a tweak, um, it's going to be a really good one. You know, if they if they bang a patch out for it and sort of tweak that roll rate a little bit. Uh, and it's a lovely model, so uh, so yeah. What else do you need to know? Great manual as well, as I said. Yeah, no, that manuals uh, manual adds a lot of value to it as well. That's uh, that's really cool. So anyway, yeah. What are you waiting for? Go and get it. Anyway, that's it for Chocks Hanger for this uh, this episode. Look out for the next one coming shortly, probably tomorrow or possibly tomorrow if I get time to do it. Anyway, that's all for now. Bye.